This is the farm Mr. Buckles lived on, and this is Charlestown, West Virginia, not to be confused with Charleston. It's about a 300-year-old farm. If you were to look out and sit on this porch, you would look at the mountains and the Cumberland Gap, but you'd look at the mountains of Antietam and Harper's Ferry. It is most likely factual that the people sat on this porch and listened to the cannonballs echo and the cannon shots echo at the Battle of Antietam and Harper's Ferry. Uh, the Washingtons at one point owned this farm, and I spent weeks at that farm uh, documenting Mr. Buckle's story because it's just so incredible. So this is Mr. Buckles in his study. He was a prolific reader. Uh, this is the first formal portrait I did of him in about 2008 or so. Now what makes him exceptionally interesting was not only was he a World War I ambulance driver and a courier who escorted generals and high level officers during World War I, but in World War II, World War II veteran? Yeah. Where did you serve? South Pacific. Did you ever hear of a island called the Philippines? We're there. We're there. Did you ever hear of a town called Los Banos? No. Los Banos was a prison camp. It had about 3,000 civilians in it. Mr. Buckles was captured as an American civilian and sent to a Japanese prison camp for 39 months. So, when I photographed them as I traveled the nation, I figured rather than just have some nice portraits of some senior citizens, each portrait has to tell a story. So built into this image, behind him is his German belt that he traded a pack of cigarettes for from a German officer from World War I. And then inside of that belt was his meal cup that he ate out of for 39 months. When he got out, he was about 80 pounds. Uh, the 111th Airborne, got wind that the entire camp was going to be executed by the Japanese on February 23, I believe, 1945. They escalated their rescue plans and as the prisoners of war were lined up outside of their barracks being prepared to ex be executed, they were praying to God to be rescued. And over the horizon came the airplanes and out of the airplanes came the 11th Airborne came in and rescued every single prisoner of war without one fatality. Not one American life was lost, lost, not one of the airborne was lost. So just a pretty incredible story that Mr. Buckles also lived through that. Um, kind of an interesting fact was Mr. Buckles was in World War I in the German style helmets, I don't bring one with me tonight, but as you know the German style helmets, the World War II American helmets took on a similar shape. So when he saw the Americans for the first time, since he had been in a prison for nearly four years, he thought initially that they could have been Germans because of the shape of their helmet. The other thing that's interesting about the rescue is they'd never seen parachutists. They'd never seen paratroopers before. So it, they were locked inside of this J a Japanese prison camp for so long that they didn't even know that we had American paratroopers to come rescue them. So imagine the surprise when you see the, the skies filled with these strange looking apparatuses and these are parachutes coming to rescue you on the day that you were going to be executed. So Russell Coffey lived in Ohio and he was about 109 when I interviewed and photographed him. It's a 48 star American flag. I left three stars in the background to symbolize the three centuries this man lived through because he was born in the 1800s. So kind of an amazing feat. Um, the very first veteran that I photographed for World War I at this round, uh, I started documenting veterans in 96, but for this project he was the first one and he was nearly comatose when I photographed him. Right off to the side was a nurse that would literally scream into his ears, Russell, open up your eyes! And Russell would open up his eyes just for a brief second and I'd be able to take a few shots. Antonio Piero was in Swampscott, Massachusetts near Salem. And if you're not familiar with military medals, this is his campaign ribbon from World War I with the bars of the battles he was involved in. This is his Legion d'Honneur from France. Um, his job was to train the horses on the ship as they traveled to the European theater of World War I. And what he told me about, which was kind of fascinating, was he didn't train them in English, he trained them in French. 
So the horses needed to learn the French battle commands so that they could go off to war. Uh, kind of an interesting quick story on him. Uh, after the Pentagon opening, his grandson came to a little private reception we had and told some stories. And at about the age of 105 or so, Antonio climbed up in a tree. Don't know why. But uh, climbed up in a tree and the ladder subsequently fell down. Well, there he was at 105, stuck up in the tree. And his neighbor walks by, who's also 100. So Antonio starts yelling down to the neighbor, and the neighbor doesn't hear him and starts looking around. So Antonio thinks, what do I do? So he starts picking up walnuts and starts throwing the walnuts down at his neighbor. Eventually, the two old men rescue each other, and there they are. <laughs> but some other fun stories with Antonio. But he was Italian. He was actually featured in Esquire magazine about six months uh, before he died for his advice on life and talked about uh, how he picked up women, which was kind of interesting to hear from a 108 year old man. But, uh, Charlotte Winters was the last female veteran from the United States of America. Uh, she convinced Rear Admiral uh, Daniels, I believe, to allow women to serve a more active role in the United States Navy. She's also one of the original founding members of the American Legion. She was a member of the Betsy Ross Post, which merged with American Legion Post, I believe one or two in Washington, D.C., and led to the formation of what we now know as the American Legion. Um, and she as well was in a pretty advanced state of uh, age and could not recall a whole lot. Mr. Babcock served a very interesting story. Um, it's hard to comprehend when you photograph centenarians and supercentenarians the spectrum of age that they contain, the life experience that they contain. But he was about 107 when I photographed him here. And his story, the, why, the reason he's clutching that same 48 star flag tightly in his hands while the Canadian flag looms over the background of him, um, he was born in the backwoods of Canada. And his, grand, or his father was a lumberjack. Not a lumberjack with chainsaws because they didn't exist. A lumberjack with axes and big saws. And his father was sawing down a tree, and the tree fell down and crushed him. And they loaded his father onto the horse and wagon, which rode his father back to the family cabin in the woods, where he later died. So Mr. Buckle or Mr. Babcock raised himself in the backwoods pretty much by himself. He lied also about his age, at about the age of 15, got sent over to England. Um, and served with the Canadian Youth uh, Corps. And he described seeing the dirigibles be shot down by biplanes. But the reason he's clutching the flag is at the time that I photographed him, there were two Americans left from the United States. And what they were trying to decide, both in the Department of Veterans Affairs and in the Army and the Military District of Washington and the White House was, what do we do when the last World War I veteran dies, and how do we honor the service of that person that represents? So Mr. Babcock renounced his American citizenship, or renounced his Canadian citizenship and became an American. He wanted to serve again in World War II and became a citizen in 46. So we had two American citizens. One served for Canada, and one, obviously, Mr. Buckles was American through and through. What do you do? with the last one. If it's Mr. Babcock and he served for Canada during World War I, how do we honor him upon his death? So that's why he's clutching the flag and he's got this immense pressure of international conflict, so to speak, of what, what does he do as an individual? So eventually what happened is Mr. Babcock renounced his American citizenship, or I should say he became Canadian again. He was not angry with America, but he declined his American citizenship the Prime Minister of Canada said, we'll allow you to be Canadian again. He had a private ceremony when he passed on, which moved Mr. Buckles into place to be the one considered. So Howard Ramsey was up in Portland, Oregon, also saw action over in France, and was at a pretty advanced stage of age as well. Um, but wonderful, happy American hero, and just a treat to get to know. So the Department of Veterans Affairs did not keep very good track records for a couple of reasons of World War I. 
Um, one, there was a pretty significant fire, I believe in the 50s or 60s, where one of the records facilities in St. Louis burned down and lost a tremendous amount of their records. Um, and the other one is they didn't keep the very good records. <laughs> um, so we had thought we'd located all the World War I veterans working with the Department of Veterans Affairs, but then I began working with another couple of private investigators, so to speak, to try to make sure that we had them all. And a friend of mine located uh, Harry Richard Landis living in Florida. Our Harry Richard Landis never left the United States, but he did serve during World War I. So my parents uh, lived in Florida or lived in Florida during the winter. So I flew down and spent some time with them, drove up, and we photographed Mr. Landis. And I photographed his uh, enlistment papers, and I emailed those to the Department of Veterans Affairs, which set in a chain reaction of verification. We did verify that he was indeed a World War I veteran. And as a result of that, there were two veterans again of World War I, Mr. Buckles and Mr. Landis. So when Mr. Landis passed on, I uh, was interviewed on All Things Considered with Robert Siegel for NPR. We discussed at great length uh, Mr. Landis. He was still married, wonderful gentleman. So there again, 48 star flag, sorry on this side, you can't see it, but 48 star flag in the background just to continue that lineage through the full collection.